Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be covering today topic wise. Now, large assemblies, it's something that comes up time and time again. So there's a lot of material on it. Now for today, we're going to stay focused because we're trying to keep it to a, a short time span. And so what we're going to focus on for the agenda for today is going to be on what is a large assembly. So defining it and then also the causes of slow opening, but it's, it's actually broader than that. So it says slow opening, but we're also going to be covering, you know, slower rebuild times and things along that line so that we can actually look at performance, right? So what are some of the causes that may be may make our system perform not as well as we want, right? It's not optimal. And then we're going to talk about using good technique, which will actually tie in with that. Now, I'm sure those of you that are here have run into performance issues before with large assemblies, and you felt something like our friend Bob here, right? You know, and so what we're going to see is how we're going to address those issues so that you don't end up like Bob. All right, so what makes an assembly large? Here's our definition portion. Number one thing is the number of components or sub assemblies. Uh, this does somewhat tie in with your hardware. So depending on the hardware that you have, um, it, it could have an effect on what number of components actually you start to see performance issues with. Uh, but regardless of what hardware you have, at some point, the number of components or sub assemblies, uh, you, may, you may hit a roadblock or a hurdle. And so you start seeing performance issues. Uh, another thing that affects it is the overall file size. And we're going to go in depth on that and and show you some methods on how to tackle when you come across large file sizes and how we can address it so we can improve your performance. And then we kind of throw this one in there as a catch all because, you know, sometimes you'll you'll take a performance hit and you'll look at your assembly and say, hey, you know, I don't have a thousand parts in here. I don't even have 500 parts, but I'm still I'm still seeing some performance issues. How, how do I address that with my assembly? Well, you may actually just have files. You know, just a few files that are taking a long time to open or save or rebuild. And, you know, that's ultimately the culprit in the issues that you're seeing. So we include those in this as well. Uh, the, the techniques that we apply to the large assemblies also apply to individual components. All right. Now, I kind of tie this in with the definition portion, but, you know, a lot of this is kind of helping to put boundary conditions to how the software is functioning and where you might be finding issues on the performance side. Now, for the assembly opening process, we're going to go through this so it gives you a better idea of how SOLIDWORKS is actually opening the file and the process that it's going through for the opening and also the rebuild process. So number one is going to be your global folders. So it's all the way up here where you see history sensors and annotations. So that's the very first thing. Next, it's followed up by the default reference geometry. So the front plane, top plane, right plane, and origin, those are the second thing to actually be open. And then we finally see our assembly components. So the parts and sub assemblies that are coming in, that's when those actually get rebuilt. So if you look at that, you see that that's actually third on the list. So they aren't even, you know, they aren't even the first or second item. Then it's followed up by mates. Fifth is going to be our update holders. And then last but not least at number six is assembly and order dependent features. So things such as adding, uh, you know, a cut feature such as an extruded cut or fillets at an assembly level, those are going to get uh, opened and rebuilt last. Uh, other things that are included in that would be patterns. So if you're patterning hardware, those are going to come in at the very last stage. All right, now let's start talking about what are some of the causes of slow opening. So CAD is a linear process. So it has to retrieve and open the files one at a time, partially because it's history based, right? So it's opening all those things one at a time. So it's going to take us. You have a, a limit to how fast it can go anyways, just because CPU processors. Generally speaking right now, um, the cap is around 5.4 to 5.6 gigahertz in speed. So nothing, nothing can go faster than that. That's that's basically where the limits at. And so once you have a certain number of components in there. It's just going to take a while. Now things are going to add to that time frame as far as latency, 
uh, depending on where the files are, are located. So if you have, say, the files spread out all over your C drive in lots of different folders, it's going to add a little bit of extra time for each one of those folder or files because SolidWorks has to go find it and retrieve it and then bring it back inside SolidWorks. Um, so the number of layers and, and how far spread out the files are will contribute to some degree. Uh, other things that have an effect, what type of hard drive are you using? Are you still using an old school you know, disk drive, a spinning disk drive, or are you using an SSD or even the newer NVMe drives? If you're using an SSD or an NVMe drive, you're going to see a big performance boost over an old hard drive. Antivirus software is another thing that can cause performance issues, especially when you're talking about opening files. So depending on how that's been set up by your IT team, you can actually see performance hits. And let's just go ahead and address the elephant in the room, which is a lot of times people have files on the network drive and they're working across the network. Now, I'm going to go through the reasons why you don't actually want to do this and why it's going to why it causes performance issues. So really, you want to be working locally. That's the fastest way to utilize SolidWorks, and it's going to leverage all of the computational resources and power of your workstation. So let's talk about the reasons why if you're using a bunch of files in your large assembly that are all located on the network drive and you're opening that file from the network drive and you're seeing SOLIDWORKS chug a little bit. The reasons for this are because when you go to open that file on the network drive, what actually happens is when you go to open it, it gets broken apart into a bunch of tiny little pieces. So those pieces are packets. So they're packets of information that are going to get routed from the network drive back to your computer. Now, in order for this to happen, those packets actually include a lot of information so that the file will actually function. So there's actually a header and a footer on each one of those packets, and that includes information such as source and destination network address, error detection codes, and sequencing, sequencing information to put the file back together again. Now, it's bringing this over onto your drive in a temporary file folder, but it's still pushing data back to the network every single time. So you got to realize that when you're going to say save the file, it's going to actually have to break down information and send it back at the same time. Now, one of the important factors to realize about this is all those little data packets is if one of those data packets gets dropped while it's transferring over the network, you can end up with file corruption. And I've personally had this happen to me, and it is not a fun experience. But, you know, these are the types of things that you need to be aware of when you're working with this data. Now, with that said, part of the reasons for this are because CAD files do not work the same way that, say, a traditional Excel spreadsheet file or Word document works. You know, if we're opening an assembly, right, let's say that that assembly file has 1,000 parts in it. All of those parts, if we open it resolved, they are all immediately editable. So they're parametrically linked and editable. So when you open that one file, you're essentially working on a thousand and one files all at the same time. So the way that the resources are gonna be pulled across the network is gonna be different. Now let's take a look at a different workflow. Let's say we take that file that's on the network, and this time we want to copy that file from the network to our local uh, local hard drive. <clears throat> when we do that, notice that the packet sizes that are shown here are much larger. So when you copy a file from your network drive and bring it over to your local drive, it is in fact actually bringing it over in a much larger packet size. So you're getting better performance because it, you have a less number of headers and footers, and each one of those headers and footers are adding a certain amount of computational overhead or cost to your performance. So by you're having less of those just in terms of getting it across from the network. But the other thing that is hugely advantageous is now when you copy that file directly to your hard drive and then open it, you are working locally. So you're working directly from your hard drive. And so you get to utilize all of the resources that are available to you from your workstation. So this is 
the best way to work. And if some of you are lucky enough to have PDM, the great thing about PDM is this is this is very similar to what PDM is doing automatically. It's only it's actually doing it with even larger packet sizes. So you, that's the reason why it performs so much better. Now, <clears throat> the next question I'm sure many of you will have. How do I find out if some of the files in my assembly are on the network drive and not on my local drive? Well, I'm glad you asked because SOLIDWORKS actually has a way for us to do this very quickly. So from inside SOLIDWORKS, you just click on the file drop-down menu and then click on the option that says find references that you can see right here. And it will pull open this window that shows us all of the, fi uh, all of the file references for the different part and sub-assembly files inside our top-level assembly. And, you know, obviously I put in some funny ones in here just as a joke, but it will go ahead and show you where everything is located. And so you can very quickly recognize whether something's not located on the local drive, because notice it does show you what drive the files are located on. So these are on the C drive, but if something was on, say, like an N drive or an E drive, it would immediately pop up there and it would be easy to find. Now. What are some other causes of slow opening? So a big one is when SOLIDWORKS files have not been updated to the most current version of SOLIDWORKS. So if your company uh, has recently updated from say SOLIDWORKS 2018 or 2019 and gone to 2020 or 2021, if those files have not already been updated, when you go to open an assembly file, all of those unupdated files are actually causing a performance hit because they haven't been converted to the newest version. Now, the part of that is because the code does get updated for the, the kernel every single year. And so SOLIDWORKS is constantly adding enhancements to make the software perform better. And so if you have an older version, it doesn't have the uh, that new capability inside of it yet. You have to actually update it to a newer version. Now, with that said, there are a couple of ways to actually uh, update the files very rapidly. And we can do that with the SOLIDWORKS task scheduler, or if you have PDM, it has its own tool for doing that. So let's go ahead and take a look at both of those. Now, the first one is the SOLIDWORKS task scheduler. It's gonna be located underneath your uh, Windows programs list, underneath the SOLIDWORKS tools, and then you'll see the option for SOLIDWORKS task scheduler. Uh, do keep this in mind, though. The task scheduler is only available in uh, licenses of SOLIDWORKS Professional and SOLIDWORKS Premium. Um, you can also uh, update multiple files at once from inside the assembly file. There's actually a systems option for that, and you just hit save, and it'll update those files all at once. Now, if you have PDM, PDM has its own tool for doing this, and it's called the file version upgrade tool. So everything does need to be checked into the vault before you run the upgrade tool. And then it'll run a report at the end and let you know if any files were corrupt or errors were encountered. So if, uh, depending on the size of your vault, this can uh, take a while. So we, we often recommend that you share the task among several computers or have it run, uh, you know, end of the day on a Friday. All right, so what are some other reasons for slow opening? Uh, this is a big one just for performance in general, and that is excessive part detail. Now, it depends on your situation, on, on how we kind of look at this, but one of the biggest culprits is going to be hardware. So a lot of people actually have hardware that is not simplified. It actually has threading on it. Now, you have to keep in mind that to create that thread, even though it looks nice, uh, it is going to cause the file size to grow and the number of graphics triangles that are needed to be calculated, it's, that's also going to grow. And it's actually quite significant. So if we take a look here, we can see on the left-hand side here, we have a simplified bolt. That simplified bolt has a little under 1,100 surface triangles. Now, if we have the bolt with threads, we're at close to, you know, you're about 5,900 surface triangles, almost 6,000. So you're looking at about a five to six X increase in the number of surface triangles that need to be calculated. Now that 
is obviously going to cause performance issues because if you have a lot of hardware that's like that, you just have a lot of hardware that's causing extra computations, but it doesn't really give you anything other than look nice. Uh, I always suggest using simplified fasteners and just applying a cosmetic thread. Some other areas where you might see excessive detail. Uh, in this example, we're looking at a giant telescope. So this is a multi-story telescope. And, you know, depending on your situation, you may not need all of these components in there, or you may not need them fully resolved, or you may not need them to have very high detail settings. Uh, if we take a look at in here, we can see that circled in orange, <clears throat> that is a bridge port. And not just one, but two. Now, depending on the situation that you're trying to use this file for, that, that may be a bit more than we really need detail-wise. But if you really want it in there, we can still show you some techniques on, on how to keep that stuff in there while also still having good performance. All right, now, if you're trying to pinpoint what may be causing you some issues, such as previous versions of files, or maybe you know too many graphics triangles on certain components because somebody, the last time they saved that part out, they had the quality set, the image quality settings set really high. Well, there are some great tools inside of your assembly evaluate command manager tab to actually help you do this. And this, these are honestly the things that we do internally when we're trying to help you guys pinpoint what the issues are. This, these are exactly the things that we use and the techniques we use to find where those those issues may be occurring and address them. So we're, we're trying to teach you guys how to fish, right? So the first one is gonna be our performance evaluation tool. So you can see it right here. So evaluate tab, performance evaluation. So it has the little uh, stoplight with a little stopwatch symbol on it. And when you activate that command, you get so much good information. So we can see from opening the document, tells you how many files of previous versions are in it, tells you if any files have been modified upon opening. It shows the number of graphics triangles for all of the components, and it gives you their names and quantities. And we can see here's the total number of graphics triangles. So immediately it's showing you which items have the highest amount of graphics triangles, which is ultimately going to be eating up some of your CPU, right? Uh, other things it includes shows you rebuild performance. So it shows you any if there's any circular references. It shows you the number of mates, uh, and then down here it just gives you this great breakdown of what is actually in your assembly. So it gives you the number of parts, the number of sub assemblies. Uh, it tells you how many how many resolved documents there are, resolved components, et cetera. Uh, I mean, it really just gives you a great amount of detail as to what's happening. Now, with that said, there's another command that we use to help us address a lot of performance thing issues that, that come up. So it is the assembly visualization command, and there's actually two ways to activate it. One is directly from inside the performance evaluation command down here. And then if we go to the next slide, we're going to see that this act, this command actually helps us figure out exactly what's taking lo so long to rebuild. Now, this command, the other way to activate it is from the evaluate tab right next to performance evaluation. It's right there. Now, once you click that and activate it, what you're going to want to do next is you're going to you're going to see a property manager that looks kind of like this, except for it's going to have different names at the top of the columns right there. So what you want to do afterwards, after you've activated this command, is click this little stoplight icon. And what will happen is it will change what data is being shown, and it will immediately show not just the file name and the quantity, but it will show you the total number of graphics triangles, your SOLIDWORKS open time, and your SOLIDWORKS rebuild time. And this is another great way for us to just look at detailed information and start pinpointing, hey, I do have a couple components that they just have a super high image quality and they're actually causing me performance problems. Okay, well, that's great. We were able to pinpoint that in a matter of, you know, a couple minutes, right, or less. Another thing that's nice about this is if you actually right click 
anywhere in these columns up here, you can actually save that out as an Excel spreadsheet and you can have that data separate from SOLIDWORKS if you want to look at it. So we were just talking about image quality, right? And how that is what's actually controlling the number of graphics triangles that we're seeing. So what you're seeing here is image quality settings for a part. And where it's located is you're going to go into your system options. You're going to then click on document properties tab, go down to image quality, and then you are going to use these two little slider bars here to control the level of detail. Uh, the top one probably being a little bit more important because that's actually what's controlling uh, for your shaded and draft called quality for the HLR and HLV uh, lines that you're actually seeing. So other thing to point out is where it says save tessellation with part document. So by default, that's checked. Uh, you can technically uncheck that and turn that off if you would like. Um, generally, I do just leave it the way that it is because I'm going to show you on the next slide that, you know, this is for our part level, but you also have options at the assembly level. And when we come into the image quality at the assembly level, we do have one difference here, which is you can apply it to all the reference part documents. So if you want to go ahead and just turn the, the image quality down a bit for all of the components, you just need to check that box right there, change your setting, hit save, and you're going to immediately see it make a difference. Now, when we talk about image quality and excessive part detail, uh, here's just a nice visual example to, to give you a better understanding. So if we look at these, this is actually the same file set, but with different image quality settings, and it will not only affect the number of graphics triangles, but it affects the graph or the actual file size. So if you look at the example on the left, it still looks pretty good, but the image quality has actually been turned way down and you only have 46,000 graphics triangles and the file size is four megabits. Now the example on the right, it is 18.2 million triangles and the file size is 104. So, I mean, right away, just from the file size, just seeing the file size and the graphics triangles side by side, you get an idea of how you could be having a performance issue, right? So by turning those settings down, you reduce the file size, reduce the graphics triangles, increase your performance immediately. Now let's talk a little bit about mates. This is always important and it's, it's not necessarily very clear as to which mates actually perform better than others. So mates do actually come at a performance cost depending on the type. And we're going to be going over that momentarily to, to kind of give you a better context of the cost uh, for those different mates. But some considerations with those mates, um, you know, obviously you want to utilize all the types of mates that are available to you. Uh, you definitely want to avoid mating to in, con on, in context features if you can. Um, avoid excessive mates. Uh, there's a big advantage to using subassemblies because subassemblies you can set to rigid. So there's flexible and rigid subassemblies. And the reason why will be a little bit more clear um, when I talk about limit mates. And then I bring it up again because I can't reiterate it enough. Make sure you upgrade your files to the most current SOLIDWORKS version. All right. Now the reason why we state that is because we you you never know when a new mate's going to come out, right? So on the newer versions of SOLIDWORKS, they do add new types of mates. They've done this previously, and it always it always greatly enhances the performance. Now, with that said, let's talk about the quickest to slowest mates. So our fastest mates are the ones that are shown in green. Those are our relative mates. So the think of those as the majority of them being your standard mates that you use. So coincident, parallel, etc. Those types of mates, those have the fastest performance. The next fastest is going to be our logical mates. So that's going to be width, hinge, and gear mates. And then when we start getting into mates with a higher computational cost, we're looking at our distance mates. And then our highest, most expensive one being the limit mates. The limit mates allow for a lot of movement 
in the assembly. And so that comes with a much higher computational cost. Now, the reason why I talked about making use of sub assemblies is because the sub assemblies can be set to rigid, a uh, rigid state. And when we do that, what happens is those calculations for the limit mates get removed out of the assembly. So for our, our upper level assembly, it essentially frees up resources to help with performance. Uh, another great uh, command to utilize is the profile mate for hardware. So generally in hardware, what you often see is you see multiple mates for the hardware, right? You see three generally. You see a concentric mate, a coincident mate, and then a lock rotation mate. Now, the lock rotation mate, I personally think is a must because if you do not have a piece of hardware locked down, if you allow it to rotate, that is an extra degree of freedom that SOLIDWORKS has to calculate. So if you have 1,000 pieces of hardware and none of them have the lock rotation applied, you have 1,000 additional computations that need to be made just so SOLIDWORKS knows that the fasteners haven't rotated. By locking them, it eliminates that. Now, what we're going to show you is that with the profile mate, you actually can kill two birds with one stone. So the profile mate actually would replace the coincident mate and the concentric mate. So therefore, you have something that actually ends up costing less uh, from a computational standpoint because you actually removed out uh, an extra mate. Let's see a quick example here. Now you do still want to apply that lock rotation. Can't reiterate enough that the lock rotation is just a huge benefit. We want our we want our models to be fully defined. All right. Another good technique, folders. So I like to organize my assemblies with folders. So I place hardware. Now, it may depend on how you want to organize your hardware for this, but uh, you know whether you just dump all the different types of screws in one folder, or if you want to actually organize them out so that you know, say, you have groupings of socket head cap screws versus you know standard bolts, etc., or even just sizes. You can just group them and put them in folders. But the reason why I suggest doing this is because you can suppress out the folder. And when you suppress the folder, it suppresses all of those other pieces of hardware. And when you suppress something out, it actually removes it from RAM. But when you hide a component, when you hide a component, it is not removed from RAM. So something to keep in mind is when you suppress things out, it actually removes it out of RAM. And so it actually frees up some resources. Now, you can also do this to features, and it's especially useful when you're looking at things like um, patterning of hardware. Go ahead, throw those in a folder. You can just suppress those out too. Now, let's just do a quick reiteration of some of the, the highlights for using good technique when it comes to parts, so components. We always want to have things fully defined. So we want that to apply to not only sketches, but you know, to how that part is mated in the assembly. Where possible, we want to reduce the level of detail. Now, obviously, depending on the context of the work you're doing, uh, there are going to be times where you need to turn the detail up, and that's fine. But you know, just try to remember to turn it back down when you're done using it and hit save. Want to avoid circular references? Um, something that SolidWorks has gotten really good at over the years is it gives you warnings if you're about to create a circular reference. So it's generally very difficult to do these days, but every once in a while it does happen. Uh, but it's pretty good about letting you know that you're about to create one. So, you know, just something to keep in mind though, because a circular reference, you are essentially asking the software to solve an indeterminate problem. So, you know, it basically means you could have more than one solution. Computers aren't really made to make intelligent decisions. So, lastly, is just, if you can simple, make a simplified configuration for the part you're working on, you're once again going to free up resources, right? Now, when it comes to assemblies, it's very similar, fully defined, right? So the fewer degrees of freedom, which means more mates and or using sub-assemblies that are rigid and not flexible. Same thing, low level of detail. And then obviously we just went over organized, right? So we do throw sub assemblies in there as well because when you when you're using those sub assemblies that is helping to organize that top level of the assembly. 
and always, when possible, use rigid. All right, so in conclusion, one of the big things here is, you know, knowing the boundary conditions that we just went over is going to help you so that you can plan ahead in how you're going to set up your assemblies, right? Now, you can also, you know, set up some design standards internally if you want. I've worked at places where we've done that. So it's essentially kind of like having a standard work document, but it has some basic guidelines that it want, that everyone should follow. Uh, and then lastly, you know, the time to make changes is not when you have 15,000 parts made it together already, but, you know, sometimes it may be necessary. And hopefully with the tools that I gave you today, you'll be able to troubleshoot any issues you've come across and help simplify it down and get your performance back. Thank you.